It is good to be back home here at New Life. Last week, I had the honor to officiate one of my nephew's wedding uh, over on Lake Michigan. And so I only have three nephews left to marry off. Hopefully, somebody will find somebody over here, and I won't have to travel back to Michigan to do that uh, service. But everything went great. My nephew works for the Secret Service, and so there was comfort knowing that if something got out of hand, they would take control with no problem at all. And so it was just a, a great day. But it's interesting. No, he's, he's not, he's 38. I think he is, something like that. A little bit more laid back than I am. And he said, well, Uncle Junior, we're going to be on the beach. Have you, I go, have you reserved it? Well, no, but just first come, first serve. Okay, what about chairs? He goes, nah, we don't need chairs. I go, well, grandparents are in their 90s. It's going to be a half-hour service. Don't you think a few chairs? Oh, yeah, I'll find somebody. We'll figure it out. Don't worry. They'll be there. And so uh, it was, the parking lot was full. Nobody knew where to park but because he didn't make reservations. But anyway, just the details of things, but it was a great service. Uh, if you were here last week, you, uh, you heard Mark kick off our new series, The Emotional Healthy Church, and it's based on the book by Peter Zizero, 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 okay. I've been practicing that last name. I'm just going to call him Peter uh, for short, or Pete. But anyway, I was able to listen to him as my sister drove us from uh, across the state. And so I listened to the worship, listened to Rachel do our congregational prayer. And so Mark gets up and starts speaking, and my sister looks at me and says, what are you listening to? That sounds like Mark from your church. I said, yes, I've been listening to the whole service. And since she's two years older than me, I was able to make the snide comment, yeah, I know you old people have a hard time understanding what streaming is, but that's what this is. Look at my phone. You can see it. So it really was encouraging. She told me something that I can't repeat here in church about my comment. But, but nonetheless, uh, I, I am still amazed that we could be driving across the country and I can still pick up our service. So if you're ever out of town, you can, can watch us uh, from, from online. So to our online friends, welcome, and thank you for tuning in. Let me pray. Again, Lord, for, for this, your church, I thank you. For those here and joining us online, I thank you. I pray that as we talk about looking beneath the surface of our life, that the thoughts that are on the minds of, of these, your people, and the words that come from my heart will be acceptable in your sight because you are our strength and our redeemer. And the people said, amen. Well, I'm not sure if it's said much nowadays, but I know growing up on the playground, probably 50 years ago, uh, that there was a pattern on, on some of our dialogue or conversations or teasing, so to speak. And it was pretty common that when you didn't like something somebody did, that at least in my neck of the woods, we would uh, say something sarcastic to that person. It was probably true in one way or another. Maybe it was something sarcastic about that they were wearing glasses, that they had braces, the vehicle their parents drove, where they lived. I didn't say it was nice, uh, but it, it was the truth. And we would just put a little twist to it and, and just make some snide remark about them, really as a way to get back at them, to, to hurt their feelings. And the person would respond back with something even worse to us or, or call us a name. And the comeback line was always, and maybe you have heard it, truth hurts, doesn't it? Because all I said was the truth to you. You know, Gary, I could say some sarcastic remark about your baldness, and you would make a sarcastic remark about my wannabe beard, and I would say, yeah, truth hurts, doesn't it? You know, just back and forth that that would go. And so as we begin and continue to look at what it means to be an emotionally healthy church and emotionally healthy person, I think we are fearful of diving into the subject 
because there is something in our minds and in our hearts that says to us, the truth hurts. And so I would like to state today and have us think not just through today and and this series, but as we live life, that we need to look closely and to remember what we read in John 8, 32. It's on page 746 in your uh, Bibles and the chairs, but, and I think most of us know this verse, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth is that Jesus loves us. No matter how we look, where we live, what we drive, what we did, what we didn't do, Jesus loves us. He rose from the dead for us. And no matter, again, no matter who we are, what we've done, what we haven't done, that his love covers us. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So if throughout the week you are thinking and pausing, (coughs) again, think of John 8, 32, and commit that maybe to memory or or bring it back to to the surface of your mind as you go through the week. (coughs) Again, last week we heard one of the... Excuse me, one of the major quotes from the book that we're going to hear over and over again, and that is it is not possible for a Christian to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Again, folks, it is not possible for a Christian to be spiritually mature while emotionally immature. And that's why we just feel it's important to once again dive into this subject. Again, in in the Emotionally Healthy Church in the book, we read stories about, and I know many, many of us can relate from our own experiences of people who are biblically intelligent. You could probably call them the Bible answer person. And yet they are so emotionally unaware that, that they crash and burn in their relationships, in their marriages, in their businesses, in their jobs, and in their church. And so this week we are going to continue uh, through the book and we're going to be looking at the, the, the area that's, that's called looking beneath the surface. And again, I think some don't want to because they're plugging in at least the tape, if you grew up in my neighborhood, the truth hurts. And yet we need to remember as we start to look beneath the surface that we, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And the reality is that you won't be able to look beneath the surface with the help, without the help of somebody else. It's a pretty lonely journey and if you don't have somebody that you trust, somebody from your life group, uh, a friend, uh, some of the, that used to, uh, you used, maybe you used to work with them. If, if there's not somebody that you trust, uh, it can be a very scary journey. And, and also, the reality is for, for some of us, uh, looking beneath the surface is probably going to cause us to look at some, some experiences and some emotions that are extraordinarily painful. Some things that we just want to avoid at all cost. And it may take somebody more than just a friend. It may take a counselor for you to to meet with for a few weeks or a few months to help you maneuver through that pain, maneuver through that emotion so that you can come out at the other end knowing that the truth will set you free. And so again, as a church, one of our values is to live in community And so as we work through this book again, to remember that, yes, that is one of our values and and it's important to have that, whether you're in a crisis or not, to be in community. But I also know that it's easy for us to say, well, God loves you, God's created you for community, so you need to be in it. That's easy to say. It's easy to say that you've been wired to be in relationships with God and other people. And until you take that step to do that, to join a life group, are you really honestly doing that? So I know it's easy to say those things. But I am also fully aware that some of you choose not to step into community because of the subject 
we're talking about today. Because you know as you get closer to people, as you learn to trust people, that somewhere, somehow, you're going to have to look beneath the surface to discover why you're doing some of the things you're doing, and some of you just don't want to go there. And so I just encourage you, again, to lean on the reality that you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And to remember that this, this journey is not to be lived alone, that you need to be able to, uh, to share with others. Others need to be able to see you also struggling and processing and thinking through things so that they will see people of integrity, so that they will know that you're a person of honesty, so that they know that you will not judge them. And together, it's going to be amazing how God can use you and will continue to use our church as we look beneath the surface. And so as we, as we begin today, I'm going to be asking a two-part question that emotionally healthy churches ask as well as emotionally healthy people. And I think we understand that we can't be an emotionally healthy church if we're not emotionally healthy people. That somewhere from within, we need to be able to identify and understand our emotions, bring them together with our spiritual journey, and, and be okay with that. And so the question that, that will take some courage and strength to, 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 to answer is, what is going on that Jesus is trying to change, bring attention to, or what is Jesus leading me into? Again, when something hits the fan in your life, and if it hasn't, it will sooner or later, begin to start to ask yourself, what's going on that Jesus is trying to change me or trying to bring attention to? Or maybe what is it that Jesus is, is leading me into, to step into, to maybe be a problem solver or to wrestle with some issues myself so that I can be of help to others? Well, again, emotionally healthy churches are, again, made up of emotionally healthy people. And it's, and it's uh, helpful to understand that our lives, I think, Mark, you mentioned this last week, are like an iceberg, right? Did you mention that? If not, it's in the book. So let's just, just take a look at, at an iceberg. I think most of us know an iceberg here. So an iceberg, as you look at it, uh, you only see a little bit of it. You know, most of the time it's about 10%-ish and everything else is, is underneath it. And if you remember the, the, uh, the story of the Titanic, I don't think any of you were around back then, uh, I think 1912, something like that. Uh, if you are, we're going to give you a party. But anyway, uh, you know, the Titanic sank, not because of what it hit on top, but because it, it hit part of the iceberg that was underneath the iceberg. And, and for us as people, what we see at top is just a little bit of us. But what's on top is really driven from what's underneath. And that's the idea here of being an emotionally healthy person is trying to figure out what is going on underneath me that is causing me to respond certain ways. Now, we may use the term also, okay, what's, what's pushing my buttons? Because I respond a certain way. You respond a certain way for things that some of your, your, your family and your friends are going, what's up with that? All he said was this. All she said was this. But you are flying off the handle for some reason. I'm guessing that something under the surface has occurred that's triggering something that you just need to, to be aware of. And that's why it's also important, again, as we uh, live our lives, not just throughout this series, but as we live our lives as people, that we remember what's found in Proverbs 4.23. Again, that's on page 440 uh, in, your, in your Bible there. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. So something's happened someplace, folks, to us that we respond certain ways. We give to certain causes. We volunteer for certain things. We withhold ourselves from certain things because something's 
under the surface that we're probably unaware of that we need to, to lean into so that we can become emotionally healthy. And I know that many of our hearts have been torn and bruised and kicked and manipulated in so many ways that we really have no idea how to guard our heart. Or we'll say, I've tried to, but yet still I feel horribly abused or broken or manipulated. And yet the, really, the wonder of God's spirit moving in our hearts is that God can, as we slow down, God can often use the pain that we have experienced, the, the, the horrible situations that we have found ourselves, find ourselves into, God can use those and, and change us. Really, maybe God, not maybe, God didn't or, uh, uh, ordain some of those things to happen. God didn't cause some of those things to happen. People make some horrible choices that impact you or that your choices have impact others. But nonetheless, God can, can use those situations to bring uh, you closer to him and bring others closer to him as well. And so uh, I think it's, it's interesting that uh, it's, sometimes you would think about this subject uh, when something hits the fan, you know, maybe in the church, you know, something's gone horribly wrong, and so we need to become emotionally healthy people, emotionally healthy church, uh, and even in your own lives. It's good to, to dive into these things when things are relatively smooth and calm, uh, you want to naturally dive into them when you're a train wreck. You naturally want to dive into them when you've hit the, when you've hit the iceberg and your life has fallen apart. It, you have no other choice at times but to figure out, why am I doing this? Why have I just launched into a, a, an argument with my spouse that was just a stupid argument? What's going on? And so it's easier and probably healthier for us to talk about some of these things when it's not, when the, when the seas aren't so rough, so to speak. And so again, I think the bigger the pain, the more we dive under and try to figure it out. And the more smooth things are, we have the tendency to sort of ignore under the surface things because everything looks okay. And so just, just again, keep that into mind as we, as we think through this idea of, uh, of looking beneath the surface. As we begin uh, to look beneath the surface, uh, it is, again, I think in, important that we, we talk about some, some different things that have happened in our lives and think about those things. Uh, you can sit there and say, yes, I hear you, Pastor. Yes, that makes sense. But I grew up in a world, or I grew up, I work in an environment, or my family it has this heritage, and we just don't think about or talk about our feelings and our emotions. That just isn't the right thing to do. Again, in the book, Peter gives us four components of how we could, could dive into this subject in a way that's redeeming for everybody. And so I'm going to share with you what those four components are. And the first one is that we develop an awareness of that, that you or I develop an awareness of, of what you are feeling and doing. Okay, so we, const, we constantly see Jesus taking uh, his people, especially his small group, the 12 disciples. He is constantly taking them below the surface in order to transform them from the inside out. And, and we talk about that. We talk about that our faith isn't just in our head, but that the scriptural truths need to get into our heart, change our hearts, change our beings, so that it changes us and transforms us in, in what we do, how we respond to people, and, and how we act. And so this first step, step of developing an awareness really means it's pretty simple. It means you need to listen, but listen to your body. Listen to yourself. And some of us, that's going to be a challenge. We can't even listen to our good friends. We can't even listen to our spouses or our kids. We always want to say something. 
But this is a challenge to just listen to ourselves. So therefore, if you, if you have a knot in your stomach, if there's a tension headache that you just can't figure out, why am I feeling this? If you're grinding your teeth at night, once in a while when we'd wake up, my, my wife would say, is everything okay? I'd say, why? She goes, because you were grinding your teeth all night. It's like, no, I wasn't. Oh, yes, you were, because it woke me up. And so that's a clue as to, you know, so then I go through them. Okay, am I okay at work? What about the, you know, just go through, you know, your body's trying to tell you something. And so maybe it's the sweaty palms. Maybe it's that you have a horrible neck ache. Maybe it's you, you just feel yourself tightening up or that you have that, calm, that constant foot tapping. And you don't notice it, but everybody else does. And so is that telling you something's wrong? Is that telling you you're uncomfortable about something that, ooh, you, you better pay attention to that? Again, just simply ask yourself, what might my body be telling me about my feelings right now? And again, you don't go on Facebook and say, oh, I finally figured out why my foot was tapping because my teacher in third grade, you know, we're not talking about those type of, of things. Uh, but just listen right now to what's going on that's going to help you to determine and figure out why you do what you do, why you say what you say. Again, for some of us, it is just going to be a huge step to connect our emotions and what we're feeling to our faith development. But take the time. Take the time. If you can't do it at the office or in the middle of the situation, take time. Create the t you need to create the time. It's just not going to fall open for you. You need to carve out some time to sit in silence with the Lord and to see what is he telling you, and to ask him. And to, you know, uh, don't do it while the TV show is going or the nightly news. Don't do it, this is one of my uh, habits, don't do it while I'm trying to listen to some music. Just sit in silence. And again, one of the beauties and one of the mysteries of our faith is that God will often speak to you during those times uh, during those times and help you to understand, oh, I need to pursue that subject a little bit more. And it, again, why it's important, because I think at times if, if I don't slow down enough, if you don't slow down enough and try to discover what's causing what, uh, then you're always going to be uh, misinformed or uh, socially, uh, emotionally, what's the, the buzzword now? Uh, emotionally intelligence. Yeah, you're not going to be aware of what you're saying or what you're doing. Uh, you may think you are just fine, but everybody else you come in contact with, they know something isn't right. And they would love to help you. You're just unwilling uh, to go there. And I think for, for some of us here, what lies before the surface and the one thing that, that we really don't want to be underneath the surface, but it is, is really, uh, have, it has to do with the church. Maybe with Christians. Many in this room, and probably even more outside of this room, have a huge area that is submerged underwater that is labeled the church. We don't want it to be there. We wrestle with it. It's like, how can the church be one of my, my submerged areas, one of, one of the hidden areas in my life? I don't want the church to be there, but it is. Now, maybe it was a staff member that, who was abusive and treated you horribly and painfully. Maybe the church was too legalistic. You can't do this, you can't do that. Or maybe it was too unforgiving when you made a poor choice. The church has been abusive to people of color, color, to women, to the infringed. And maybe that is what is under the surface for you. It has built walls against what you think is fun, and it has made its tradition so firm that when something is done differently, when, differently than we have done it in the past, 
you feel uncomfortable, there's a knot in your stomach, and you really don't deal with it, and all it is is a tradition. It's just that something has changed. And so you have a meltdown on top of the iceberg because something is brewing underneath that you just haven't taken the time to process and even to process with somebody else that can help you figure out what's going on. And so for me, underneath my iceberg there with the church is the memory of my mom not wanting to attend church. Oh, she would attend whenever I was speaking, even in high school and stuff. She made sure she was there. But otherwise, she wouldn't go to church because she felt there were two reasons. One is that my folks were divorced, and so she, back 40-some years, 40, eh, 45-ish years ago, uh, divorce was a, uh, a huge, uh, you wore the big D. In fact, part of the history of new life, from what I understand, is that back in the day, whatever the day is, uh, new life was known for being a church that welcomed those who were divorced. And the, and the rumors were, and the, and the buzz was that if you'd gone through a divorce and your church didn't like you because of that, or, or labeled you as a second-class citizen because of that, you know what? Go to new life. You're going to experience God's grace. And so that's a rich part of our heritage. Not that we say divorce is that God ordained it. Obviously, God wants people to reconcile, but yet people make choices, and they live with those choices. And so we continue to be a place that, that is welcoming. But for my mom, again, 40 years ago, I think we are, well, nobody ever talked about it. Uh, we had to be one of the only uh, families who were divorced uh, because I felt it even as the child there. And then the other thing was that she felt she didn't have good enough clothes to attend church. And so part of my iceberg is that I really don't want anybody not to be here because they think they have to dress up. Now, if you want to wear a tuxedo, go ahead. If you do, there's probably something else underneath your iceberg to talk through. Uh, but if you want to wear a suit, and tie, I'm okay with that. But the reason I dress a little bit more casual, because, first of all, I feel a little bit more casual, but I really, my, my iceberg issue is that I don't want people who are searching, who are seeking to strengthen their faith to be turned away because they feel like they have to dress up. They feel like they have to go out and get a new outfit for Sunday morning versus just come as you are. And so if you at times think, oh, pastor needs to wear A, B, or C, just reframe that and, and think of somebody you know who doesn't love Jesus and, and say a prayer for them. Okay, so the second component uh, uh, to help us to figure out what does it mean and how can I get below the, the surface is asking the why or the what's going on question on why you're doing some of the things that you are doing and how is that impacting others. So for example, you may want to ask yourself, why am I always in a hurry? Why am I so impatient? Why am I so anxious? Why am I overly concerned that others tell me that I'm okay as a teacher, as a leader, as a parent, as a volunteer? As pastors, you know, why are we so disappointed when someone tells us they didn't get anything out of our sermon? I'm not going to say any sarcastic remarks about Mark here, but no. Uh, you know, why are we so hung up that we hear something positive? Why am I so anxious about this meeting that's coming up? Why am I so anxious that the teacher meeting is coming up and they just called us in for a reason? You know, what's going on inside of me? Why am I so overly, overly concerned that I succeed? Why, am I, why do I avoid confronting difficult people at church or in my life group? And here's one that I've been asking myself for years. Why do I need to immediately return phone calls, emails, or text messages? And my staff keep asking me, why do I send them at all hours of the night? You know, I don't know. 
uh, there's some issues there, I'm sure, but that's just, I'm, I'm aware of it and I'm trying to deal with it. So anyway, uh, why does my house need to be spotless? Why, do I, why don't I want food in my car? If you're a student, I never had this issue. Why do I always need to get A's? Uh, why do I need to get uh, to always get complimented on what I wear, what I brought to the church dinner, what I shared at church? Uh, so there are a lot of different questions that you can ask yourself. And so take the time to do that. A again, especially when you realize what's dr that, that, that that particular question is driving you. You know, how can you, you know, if, if it's cleaning the house, you know, sometimes you're going to sit there and say, why in the world do I have to have it just spotless? It's just three of us here. Why does everything have to be in its spot? And if it isn't, I go off the deep end. There's a reason for that and try to, 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 to lean into that. Again, people, some of those answers are going to be so buried that you just need to slow down your pace and listen to yourself and listen to God as God peels back some of the reasons that potentially you are doing what you are doing. And again, we can be so blinded to ourselves and we can all think we're A-OK -okay and nothing is wrong that when those subjects come up, it could be just, you know, it could be for me the, the texting and the message sending. You know, why am I so adamant to get at that? ASAP that it delays my day 30 minutes or an hour or when I'm even having dinner with my daughter she, again I shared she'll take my phone and turn it over it's your dad we're here together to have a in her sarcastic way a father daughter bonding time and so don't look at your phone as she goes off to the bathroom with her phone and she's texting but anyway uh, so Blaise Pascal says this, all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone. Folks, I think because there's not a huge cost to it, the idea of sitting and listening to God and listening to God reveal himself to you, we think there's no value to that. It's so easy to do, we just think there's no value. So for some of us, it's easier to drop 150 bucks on a therapist who's going to tell you to slow down when everybody in your life has been telling you to slow down for years. But because you've just spent 150 bucks on this person, you're going to probably listen to him or her a little bit more. And so we need to sit down and we need to, to listen to God. We need to open up ourselves to others. And again, that verse, John 8, 32, we need to, to internalize that you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Nothing to be afraid of because what is going on underneath is causing some stuff up here that you need to wrestle with. And when you get rid of some of this stuff up here, you're going to be happier with yourself. You're going to be able to, 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 live more, to live more into the life that God wants you to live because you're having healthier relationships because you know what is pushing your button. The third component is this. We need to link the gospel and the emotional health together. We need to link the gospel and our emotionally health together. That's a lot of this whole premise of the book. But for, for uh, and for, just say, for, for many times in the series, the idea of looking beneath the surface of our lives is going to be scary, but we need to remember that Jesus takes care of that. That sounds pretty trite to me. But some of you, I am sure, you're thinking you are on a tightrope walking if I had the cordless, I could walk. You're walking the tightrope, and you are deadly afraid that you're going to fall as you look at what is beneath the surface. And there is no safety net. But again, the good news is that Jesus is our safety net. Again, in the book we read, the gospel says... I take a look at the screens here. The gospel says that you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe. You are more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope because Jesus lived and died in your place. I think we have that on the screen. If not, I'm going to read it again. There it is. 
The gospel says that you are more sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe. Folks, none of us are perfect. You don't need me to tell you that. More sinful and flawed than you ever dared believe, yet you are more accepted and loved than you ever dared hope because Jesus lived and died in your place. And people, that is our safety net. That is the truth that is going to set us free. And that is what gives us the courage to look under the surface. Now, saying that doesn't mean you're all wing nuts and you don't know what's going on in life. You know, we're not up here saying the whole church is emotionally unhealthy. It's just a series for us as we continue to grow and move into the future for us to just to do a safety check. To spend a few weeks looking at our emotional side that so often is easy to disconnect from our spiritual life. And so as you take this journey to look beneath the surface, don't forget the gospel. It is there to catch you. It is there to help you through any of your fear or anxiety that you are experiencing. And because of the gospel, we can take risk. We can fail. We can fall. We don't have to prove ourselves to anyone. We don't need to worry about selfishness, brokenness, weaknesses, or inadequacies. Because God sees the 90% under the surface. And God loves us no matter what. We shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And then finally, the fourth, the fourth component, and it's one that I think we all, we all do one way or another, is that we need to get rid of the glittering image. <coughs> we need to get rid of the glittering image. It is just time to take down the appearances that we think are so important for everybody to see. None of us, <clears throat> I don't care what age you are, you don't like somebody who is fake or a fraud, an imitator. You just want somebody who's real and authentic. And so yet for, for some reason, we all at one time or another put on this image, this type of an image because we think we need to, to look a certain way or behave a certain way. I think as uh, pastors, when I was married, uh, Mark and Rachel, you probably do, Hartley, uh, those in, in church leadership, we struggle with this, or our spouses do, because of the expectations placed on them by you. It's easy for me to say this because I don't have a spouse right now. Uh, and that's not saying that I'm dating anybody either, so let me just clarify that. Uh, but uh, for our spouses... You know, the things that church people have said is just horrible. And so it is a natural tendency for spouses of pastors to put on this glittering image because of the expectations placed from the church. But then if we think about it, uh, I know school teachers, I know executives, uh, we all, just with your neighbors, you know, keeps up with the Joneses. Uh, that's the glittering image uh, syndrome, folks. Uh, we just need to, to, to be comfortable enough to take that down and to be authentic with who we are. Because again, the good news is Jesus is our safety net. That we shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. And so there's no reason to wear the facade. We just need to be ourselves and to be who and be comfortable with who God has created us to be. And we're not comfortable with it because we haven't been intentional to get beneath the surface at times. So again, people, uh, once again, the underlining assumption, uh, not just with the glittering image side of things, but in all of these, is that uh, we have to do it alone. And we cannot. We cannot go on this journey to look beneath the surface alone. You have to do it uh, with somebody you trust. And again, it could be a long distance friendship that you knew in the past, but somehow, some way, you need to connect uh, with others. Now, if you meet somebody out there at the hub having coffee, I wouldn't suggest that you say, hey, let's go grab coffee and go beneath the surface today. 
And so uh, build those relationships and build time into, into trusting another person. Because again, as you share in that together, you will realize that you will uh, uh, be able to have the confidence to, to look beneath the surface so that God can continue to develop you into the person that he wants you to be. So God can remove the fear from your heart, remove the fears from your lives, so that you can know the truth and the truth will set you free. And as that happens, together as an emotionally healthy church, we are going to see new life for the city happen in some miraculous ways. God's people said, Amen. And so as we continue, as we continue to worship today, we do so by allowing you opportunities opportunities to, to maybe sit or to stand and to worship opportunities uh, to give to God financially to be a partner with us as we extend to be be new life for the city we give you opportunities to come up and and uh, participate in, in communion here and in the back or we'll have a rover come around where you can uh, take the bread and, and dip it in the juice to remind us that Jesus is the truth and that he sets us free that he has given his life for us. You're welcome to light a candle up front or in the back. Again, it's maybe to signify an area that you need the light of Jesus to penetrate through, that you need the light of Jesus to go underneath the surface and to help you figure out why are you doing the things you are doing? Why is there always a train wreck on a certain subject? Or maybe you simply need to talk with somebody. Maybe you have heard the gospel that Jesus loves you but you have never internalized it and you want to make Jesus your safety net and so you can talk with somebody who's brought you today you can go over here in the corner uh, we'll have a prayer partner there that would love to have a conversation with you or simply pray with you but however way God leads you this is our time to respond to him today